My name is Mac Rusk, and I have lived in the Grand Lake area most of my life. My family first came to Grand Lake to visit an aunt and uncle who had homesteaded west of the Stillwater campground on what is now known as the Slash J Slash Ranch. Their names were Mabel and Merle Hall. Mabel was my grandmother's sister on my mother's side. This was in 1928, and the following year we moved to Grand Lake. In the years that followed, I became a friend of Craig Adams and the Adams family, who had a home at the east end of Grand Lake. Craig Adams had become a regular summer Rotarian at the Grand Lake Rotary Club from his San Antonio club. The summer of 1955, my father, Ray Rusk, was president of the Grand Lake Rotary Club and had asked Craig to give a program that fall before he left to go back to San Antonio. In those years, home recordings were a rarity, but my dad had an old Montgomery Ward wire recorder, which he had the foresight to bring to that Rotary Club meeting when Craig talked. To me, it is fabulous to have a story of his highlights of summers in Grand Lake. I hope you enjoy this tape as much as my friends and I do. Friends of Rotary, I was asked to give a little history of Grand Lake, but I don't believe I can go back far enough to give you a lot of history. So I'm going to confine my talks more to my family and experiences of myself. It's a little embarrassing sometimes to keep referring to I did this and I did that, but I believe that'll be the safer thing for me to do. My father came up here in the early 80s. At that time, he lived in Denver, and he was quite a pioneer, and he liked the wild spaces and the faraway spaces. So he came here in the early 80s with Reverend Craig, who also was a pioneer and a Christian church minister. Reverend Craig was famous in this country and lived on what is now Craig's Point. And Mount Craig and I were both named after him. My father, after he came up here, was 75 miles off the railroad from Empire by stagecoach, <coughs> as maybe you don't remember, was a one-way drive over Bertha Pass. If you met anyone, you had to either back up or the other party had to back up until you could meet a place to pass. So my father liked the place, and he decided he had acquired some property up here. So he bought from two homesteaders. One was Reverend Craig, who had homesteaded the property on the west side of what my father got, which is the south side of Grand Lake, and the east side of the lake, including the east inlet, and Adams Falls, he got from Mr. Harmon. So after he came up here, he built his first home on the point which is now Dudley Abbott's home. That was in the 80s. And my oldest brother was born, and because of the fact that it was rather deep water there, after a few years... He changed and built a home over on the east shore, located where the Peak Home is now located. And that was the place where I first <coughs> lived when I came to Grand Lake. Just a little two-room log cabin. And as a family grew, why, the house grew. I remember very well the plumbing facilities were all outdoors. The bathroom, which consisted of cutting a hole in the kitchen floor and getting a, a bathtub and sinking it underneath the floor with a trap door. We heat the water on the kitchen stove, pour it in the tub to take a bath. When we got through, pull out the plug and just let the water run the sand underneath the house. Then the third home, after we outgrew the second one, was the one that I live in at the present time. That home was built 45 years ago. All material, brick, cement, lumber, and windows had to be brought over by a rowboat. There wasn't a motorboat on the lake. Gordon Spitzmiller's father, Gus Spitzmiller, did the plumbing, 
And if you haven't come over to my house, there are three or four places up on the logs where Gus advertised and said, Gus Fitzmiller, plumber, 1910. <laughs> the old days were all, as I said, were trips by stagecoach over Bertha Pass, which was 75 miles. Many times I had to make that trip. My first trip was when I was 10 months old. Came to Denver and I was a little sick baby. My mother asked the doctor, said, well, what do you think about taking him up to Grand Lake, 75 miles off the railroad? He said, well, I don't know. I don't believe he'll be any worse up there than he is down here. So I came over by the pass in a stagecoach on a pillow in my mother's lap, this 75 miles, and apparently it wasn't any of the worse for me. In those days, the town of Grand Lake, the main part of town, was on the west side, on both sides of the outlet. Uh, on one side, the, the south side of the outlet was the old Adams Hotel. That was no relation to mine. The post office was over there. And as we grew older, my brother and I had a little grocery store, which is right back of the Burtis home now. On the north side of the inlet was the old Langley Hotel, and he was one of the old stagecoach drivers of those days. Next to this store that my brother and I had was the home of old Judge Westcott. He was a blind man, as I knew him. Had been here in the days of the Indian. And he batched there by himself in this old log cabin. And I would often go over when he was preparing his dinner, do his own cooking. He was quite a tea drinker. And for his teacup, he had one of these big tomato cans. And he had his pot of hot water on the stove he had his tomato can on the table, and when he'd get ready to have his lunch or whatever he was eating, he would reach the tea kettle, and he'd stick his finger down in this tin can like this. He'd pour the hot water, and when he felt the water touch his finger, he knew he had a cup full of tea. Another little incident that I had that I remember with Judge happened to be the 4th of July, and we were talking about fireworks. Well, nobody had any fireworks. And finally, the judge says, uh, I'll fix us up some fireworks. He said, I have some dynamite out here. We'll just fix up and we'll have some good-sized firecrackers. Well, I thought that was a good idea. Until he went and got the dynamite, and he said dynamite should be warm. So he brought several sticks of dynamite in the room, had a big fire going in his stove. He opened up the oven of the, the door of the oven and just he put the dynamite sticks in the oven to get warm I went out the front door but nothing happened the dynamite warmed up all right pretty soon we took it out on the big rock in front of his store and they put the fuse and the, and the cap in there and we put them on this big rock and set them off and we really had some good fourth of July firecrackers now the Craig home as you remember was on the point that you've been discussing, the Craig Point. Right out on the point there, big two-story home. He lived there many years. And as I said, my brother and I ran the little grocery store, and all of our groceries we hauled by freight, wagon, and team from Empire. Many de many times I come over that road, and there was no pavement of any kind, no gravel or anything. Now, in those days, we the only activities we had in a social way were what we call bonfires. We had no picture shows, none of those things, and the entertainment was bonfires. And whenever you had a bonfire and invited what few people were around the lake, it was an unwritten law that you bring your own knife and fork and plate and tin cup because none of us had enough of those things to take care of 20 or 25 people. So my dad killed a bear up on Echo Mountain. So he decided to be a good time to have a bonfire and barbecue the bear. And he and my mother were both pretty good at writing poems. So they sent out their invitation. And I'm going to read you that invitation. It was written on an ordinary old shingle, addressed to those who were invited. He faked the postmark. In those days, gave them to the postmaster, and he handed them out to the guests. I asked Ms. Cadell the other day, how about that now? And she said, well, I'm afraid I'd get in trouble if I'd do anything like that. But here is the invitation. I'm going to read it to you. It's a poem written by my mother and father. Herewith an invitation for another jubilation, which we're going to give you on the eastern shore. 
There will be mirth and recitation and a splendid congregation in such a time you will remember evermore. It will meet your approbation and will be an aggregation of all the fun and frolic there has been before. So remember you're invited and we trust you'll be delighted when on Wednesday night you come to the Eastern Shore. There'll be molasses candy, lemonade, ice cream and brandy, question mark. My dad was a strict prohibitionist, but he had to put in brandy to rhyme, so he's got the question. <laughs> yes, there'll be good things to eat and drink galore, so we hope that you are coming and that you will feel like humming. We are sorry that we cannot offer more. Then come with preparation, with song or declamation, for we're going to give a prize from Carlton's store. Ought to have some fun we're trying, and the time is swiftly flying when we must leave these shores, perhaps forevermore. Now that is signed, Mr. and Ms. J. E. Adams, August the 14th, 1903. You can just take a look at it if you wish. But that is the type of party and the entertainment we had in those days. Another incident I remember was old Jim Carnes. He had his store, the only store in those early days, located where Ms. Humphrey's store is at the present time. And he was one of the old timers that stayed in through the winter, and in the winter he trapped there and sold the hides the next year. But a couple of uh, interesting events in the life of Mr. Carnes I remember very well was he had a deep uh, cellar under his store, and he shipped his vinegar in in uh, big barrels. And whenever you wanted vinegar, well, you'd bring your own gallon or quart jar, whichever you wanted, and he'd fill it up with vinegar. So my mother went in one day with her jar and he had a little boy helper there. He said, go down to the basement and give Ms. Adams her some vinegar. So he took the jar and went downstairs. And all of a sudden, he happened to remember, and he went to the trap door, and he hollered down. He says, put a little bit of water in it. It's a little too strong. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that uh, my mother went in those days, uh, these little packages of needles that cost a nickel at home. And she wanted a package of needles. So Mr. Carnes... Uh, I said, all right, Ms. Adams, that'd be 10 cents. And she said, 10 cents, a nickel at home, what's the, how much, uh, why so much difference? He said, well, it's a freight, freight on them. <laughs> <laughs> now, old Jim Carnes was one of the old timers, as I told you. And here's one of his relics I'll ask you to be careful with. It's been broken a couple of times. I doubt if there are very many of them left, but it's a plate and a calendar that he put out the 1909 calendar. Down the bottom it shows when he was established in 1881. I doubt if you'll find maybe Miss Carnes has one. Have you got one? Now a few uh, little personal experiences I had that may interest you. In those early days, Ralph Bryant had the only motorboat on Grand Lake, and several of us were staying over at his house in the early summer. We went over town in his boat to a party. This boat was a one-cylinder job that the only way you could crank it was to crank it by hand. So we were having a good time over town, and Rout apparently thought of the idea that he was going to have some fun with us. So before we got ready to go back from town over to his house in the southwest corner of the lake, he went down and cut off the gasoline, I think, and we pushed out in the lake, and Rout gave a couple of twists and wouldn't start. So he asked one of the rest of us to try it. So we'd try a little harder than he would. Still wouldn't start. Because all the time they propeller was turning and the boat would move along slow pace still no fire out of the engine so all all of us would take a turn at it and we were anxious to get things started and we'd crank until we were out of wind get around the route he knew what was the matter and he'd take about two turns he'd puff and then passed on to us we cranked that motorboat from town clear over to southwest corner <laughs> <laughs> another little story I told the other day to Lyle and Ralph. When my brother and I were running this store, one evening we closed the store and we got one of these little Mullins steel boats and went fishing. And we drifted over toward the east shore and fishing was pretty good. And the wind was coming up a little and we decided, like some of these crazy people do, that we could do better if we stood up. So we stood up in this little tin boat. We we're doing our fishing and with our backs to the wind drifting toward the east shore and all of a sudden, one of these Grand Lake puffs hit us in the back, and we pushed forward and both stepped on the side of the boat at the same time and went down far enough to start taking water. Well, there wasn't anything we could do. We couldn't 
keep it from doing that. And so we just stood up and looked at each other as the boat kept going down, down, down. So finally got about this deep and the brother said, well, I guess we have to swim. <laughs> I said, okay, and so we started. And then more started and he told me, he said, well, you're smaller than I am. You better go back and hang on to the boat. They'll carry you and I'll swim on in. So he started and I got on the boat and I watched him and I hollered to him. I said, do you think you can make it? He said, I think you can. So I waited a minute and he was still getting a little closer. And I said, do you think you can make it? He says, I think you can. So he swam just as long as he could, he told me afterwards, and then let down. He said, if I let down and couldn't hit bottom, I, I was through. But luckily, he hit bottom. And by that time, I, the wind had drifted me in, and there wasn't anybody living on that side. Our folks hadn't come up, except the Harmons. And their home was over about where the tunnel entrance is. So we were cold and shivering, scared too. We just left the boat there and went on over to Harmon's house late in the evening. Nobody home. They were over town. So we walked around. We couldn't get in the front door, and we finally found a window open in the back, and we jimmied the window open and got in, built a fire in the stove, and started getting warm. And then we took a lamp. At that time, we took a lamp, started walking through the house to find some blankets to put around us. About that time, Mr. and Mrs. Harmon, who always rode doubles, started from home. They saw this light going through the house. They thought somebody was stealing them out of house and home. And they pretty near rode themselves to death to get home. So instead of coming to the front door, Mr. Harmon went around the back and walked up the window. And he says, hello. We said, hello, this is Craig and Carl. Well, that relieved him. He came on in. They gave us some tea and coffee and dinner. And our clothes were all wet and said, well, there's nothing for you boys to do but stay here all night. And we'll dry your clothes out and you're going back to the store tomorrow morning. So we did that was a little late getting off the next morning and somebody apparently had gone to the store to get some bread or coffee for breakfast and the store wasn't open. Somebody else came along and said, yeah, I saw those two boys over there fishing on the east side and the crazy fools were standing up in the boat. So they presumed we were in the bottom of the lake. We finally got dressed and warm and started home and we met three boatloads of people out in the middle of the lake coming over with ropes and grappling hooks to fish us out of the bottom of the lake. I don't know whether they were glad or sorry. Then I had a nice little trip, brother and I and another boy. Our wives took us up to Poudre Lake in the car. And we had all of our pack outfit on our backs. They let us out and we started walking east. Well, we headed out there along Timberline and uh, the first peak we came to was Mount Ida. As we went up Mount Ida, we looked up right to the top and there were five beautiful mountain sheep up there. Well, we thought we got them cornered, see? So we kept on going up, and, oh, we got within 50 feet of them, I guess, and they couldn't come by us, and all of a sudden we just saw them disappear over that sharp north precipice. We thought, well, they're gone and dead, and we ran on up there, and here they came out down below, about five, 600 feet below us down there. Didn't hurt them at all. So we kept on and walked on east, camped that night. We had a raw eggs with us, and we put them in a coffee pot just to protect them. Sat them, oh, six or seven feet from fire, kept a big fire all night. Next morning, we got up to cook our eggs, and we broke the first one, and it was frozen hard. It was rather with a cold night. And we found out one thing about mountain sheep on that trip. You'd hike along, you'd never see any. And finally, we decided to stop and be quiet. And we did that. And I imagine about four different times, we sat down maybe 15 or 20 minutes, just looking all over the mountainside and see nothing. Finally, you'd see the mountain sheep start moving. It's one of the wildest countries up here, I think. I don't believe there's a trail of any kind in there even at this time. And we hiked on and hit the North Inlet Trail and then came on back down to Grand Lake on the Inlet Trail. Then I had a hunting trip. Now, these trips I'm talking to you about are long ago when they had no hunting laws, no national park. So anything I say here is, was all right then. Brother and father and I took a horse and a pack and we started up back of Mount Echo and our camp was supposed to be, or was, right pretty near where the head of Columbine would come in up there. So I was leading the horse. My father and brother were flanking me on each side of the guns in case they'd find something. All the way up there, the deer flies were pretty bad that day. They were getting in the horse's ears and he was having trouble. So just about sundown, we reached the campsite. 
And I stopped there and was just standing there holding the horse. Father and brother started coming in both sides. These flies bothered that horse so much he decided he wouldn't take it anymore. He just lunged forward without any warning at all and hit me in the chest and knocked me down backward and proceeded to pounce on me a few times. And I was on my back and dodged him and he just raised me. And away he went down the mountain. He had everything we had, bedding, utensils, food, and everything. We thought, well, we'd find him in a few minutes. And we tracked him, but we never did find him until darkness overtook us. So my dad said, well, what are we going to do? We haven't got a thing. He said, well, go home, I guess. So we started home just to dusk, about six miles from Grand Lake back up there. In those days, we didn't have a flashlight. The only thing we had was some matches and the stars. We came off of that six-mile mountain after dark, got in home about one o'clock in the morning. Next morning, we got up, and Dad said, well, the horse is up there, everything. Some of us got to go back and ask me how I felt. I said, I'm all right. So we went back. We found the horse in the meadow eating, and he didn't have a thing on him. He cleaned himself of everything, including the pack sack. Well, we luckily caught the horse, and we backtracked. We picked up a piece of saddle here and a blanket there and a frying pan here and a can of corn there, dish here and so on until we backtracked and got enough to have a successful camp and hunted, and my dad killed a deer. Then the fun began. This horse had really gone crazy. To get the deer on that horse, we had to tie him to a tree where he couldn't move, and we finally got the deer on. Then we tied the deer on the horse, and one of us took a rope and started leading. Then the more started, he just got on his hind legs and started for the fellow to lead him. So he pulled him down. We t then we took two ropes, one in front and one behind. If he went for that one, we'll this and pull him back. If he went for this and that and pull him back. <laughs> and he fought till we got clear down to Grand Lake. And he uh, wasn't worth shooting after that. We practically gave him away because he was just an outlaw horse. That's all it was to it. Then I had a nice trip with my brother up. We took everything on our backs. We went right up the face of Mount Craig, right up the front. We were gone three days and two nights. Carried everything on our back, bedding, food, and everything. Dropped down back in Mount Craig in the country back there. It's just as wild as anything you ever saw. Came upon mountain sheep feeding in a meadow down there, and we slipped up on them, and finally we... Thought, well, we'll just stand up and see what to do about it. And we stood up, and there's one old ewe. She couldn't have been more than, oh, 150 feet from us, I guess. She turned around and looked at us a couple of times, and she just turned around like a dog does and just laid herself down in the grass to take a nap. And on that whole trip, we were gone three days and two nights. We saw one tin can, which shows you about uh, how many people made that country. Now, a couple of unusual events I remember. I don't know whether... Any of you here do is the murder of old man Selak. I guess you do, Clyde. Johnny. He had had some trouble with these boys, as, as I remember, because they'd been cutting wood and had them arrested. So they made up to get even with him, I suppose. So they went down to his home back of Echo and told him they were going to kill him. They wanted to rob him. And they took him out of the house and put a noose around his neck and started leading him off back of the mountain. And he apparently thought that, that he could talk him out of it, but he didn't. They took him about, I guess, a mile from his house, at least, up in a little swag up there, and one of the boys climbed a pine tree, and they had this rope around his neck, and the other one handed up and lifted him up, and the other one pulled the rope up and tightened it on him and went off and left him. Well, we were 30 days before they were found. And the way they found him, they, he had been collecting dimes. Somebody knew it. I think it was dimes. And uh, one day down at Granby, some boys came in to buy a bunch of groceries and paid about $8 in dimes. And that was the first one that they had suspicion. And they arrested them. And, of course, they denied it, put them through the third degree, and they finally admitted they had done it. And then they led us to the place they had hanged him. And I went up there when he was still hanging in the tree. And 30 days of summertime, I imagine his body must have stretched 8 or 10 inches. His hands were sloughed way down. His feet were touching the ground. Bad sight. And then the other was the Gregg family incident where Mrs. Gregg dressed up her three children on Sunday morning to go to Sunday school. The oldest one, a boy, had gone up town while he was gone. She killed all three of them and then killed herself. Two or three of you remember that. Now, those are some of the stories of my life. As Ray said, five generations have been up here, and I hope to live to see the day when the sixth one will be here. Your attention tonight, and as much as this is my last meeting with you, I have enjoyed it very much all summer, and I wish you all goodbye.
hope to see you again next summer. This South Leaders Day. Yeah, radio. <clears throat> I sure thank you for giving us this talk. Better shut this thing off, though, I guess. I'm adding a bit to this tape to help with names and locations. Echo Mountain was the old name for Shadow Mountain. Mount Craig is now known as Baldy. Craig's Point is on the south side of Grand Lake. It was the old log cabin on the rock, referred to as the Dudley Abbott home now owned by Stephen Paul. Craig Adams' home was in the southeast corner of Grand Lake, an old log home recently remodeled and now owned by Jim Bianco. Craig and Carlton Adams' store was on the old main street of Grand Lake, between Gordon Sumner's home, known as the Spider House, formerly Ray Gregg's, and the Burtis' home near the lake on the same street. The Langley Hotel was by Point Park and the Doug Strain's home. The Harmon Cottage locate, was located just south of the Adams Tunnel where people park and fish from the shore. The Fred Selak Ranch was between Shadow Mountain Lake and Granby Lake. My wife Elsie's father, Mark Fletcher, was the Grand County Sheriff at the time of the murder in July of 1926. The Fletchers said many times that Mark, in his first term of office, was re-elected due to his handling of the Selak murder. Another tragedy in the Adams family was the drowning of, Adams, of Craig Adams' grandson. A Mexican houseboy and a small Adams boy, approximately three or four years old, were in a rowboat with the houseboy rowing and the Adams boy playing with a toy boat on a string at the back of the boat. The Adams boy fell overboard and the houseboy jumped in after him. They both were drowned. After a couple of days of grappling, they did hook the houseboy's overall suspenders and brought him to the surface. The little boy's arms were still around the neck of the houseboy's, but at that point the suspenders came unfastened or unhooked and both bodies were lost. The following day they again hooked the body of the houseboy, but the small Adams boy was gone. His body was never found. There is a small plaque in memory of him on Shadow Mountain up above the Adams home. As I remember, this was about 1933-34, somewhere in that neighborhood.